So hello everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be uh, speaking at the uh, uh, ONA series for the second time. First time was two years ago. I had just started. Now it's it's fun to be back with uh, some information that we generated uh, in Florida Systems um, over the past two years, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, I'm going to be very happy to answer your questions either at the end of the presentation or by email or by phone whatever means that you might find convenient, uh, I'll be here to address some of the points that you might not be completely clear at the end of the talk today. <clears throat> so uh, last week I had a, a, the, the great opportunity that for the, for the first time to see a talk from uh, Dr. Uh, Frank Mitloner. Uh, he's a professor at uh, UC Davis and he showed this information that's, uh, that I think it's really relevant for our reality. Uh, you know, beef production and agriculture in general are under a lot of pressure. And one of the uh, points that people choose to uh, attack us is the methane production. And although I'm no specialist on uh, air quality or air composition, uh, it, called me the, uh, it called my attention this information that I'm presenting to you here. And he's showing the, uh, the, the calf, the uh, 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 cattle inventory for dairy cattle here in the bottom and for the beef cattle here on top uh, over over the course of the years and we can see here for dairy cattle that it it increased over time and then starting on the 40s and the 50s it started to decrease although as we know dairy production has increased uh, over the same uh, period of time meanwhile beef production the the the, the national beef herd uh, over some variation has been overall increasing up to the 70s and then it has decreased. Uh, a very important information here is that, and that's the realistic thing that people don't really know, but if the herd size do not increase for 10 years, then additional methane is not going to be added to the atmosphere. So it's, I think we're going in the right direction, decreasing the, the dairy herd and uh, apparently a trend of decreasing also our beef herd, but that's very important to keep in mind. So greater production, greater productivity, greater efficiency of production are going to be critical if we want to produce the same amount or a greater amount without of, 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 of protein products without having to uh, uh, increase the number of animals. So I'm going to tell you two very, very simple, simplified scenarios for but just for us to start thinking about the rest of my presentation. So I'll pose the question, how many cows do you need to produce 30,000 pounds of weaned calves? With two premises. First, a weaning weight of 500 pounds and the number of cows needed, uh, of calves needed of 60. That will be 60 times 500, that will be your 30,000 there. So in the first scenario, in a poor reproductive, uh, a poor reproductive uh, scenario with a 60% weaning rate. So from your cow, from a herd of 100 cows, you will wean 60 calves. Or in a second scenario with excellent reproduction with a 90% winning rate. So it's just simple multiplication, but it's interesting to see that if you need 60 calves and you have 60% winning rate, you need 100 cows. Because 100 cows, 60 calves, and then you're gonna get how many calves you need. Now, if you have an excellent reproduction, and you have a 90% winning rate, a winning rate with 67 cows, so 33 less cows than on the first scenario, you will get the same amount of calves and the same production. So the conclusion here is that you may have the same total production with less cows. They are more efficient reproductively. And this means less methane and will make us look good. And it's gonna be good for the environment and for our pockets as well. <clears throat> As a second very simplified example here, how many females in reproduction do you need if you breed versus do not breed yearling heifers? A few premises, you, you, you have 100 females in reproduction, you have a 20% replacement rate, you have an 80% weaning rate, so it's not 60, but it's not quite that 90% from the previous example, but 80% is realistic here for Florida. And again, your 500 pounds winning weight. Well, here, here's the answer. So if you breed yearlings, a possible scenario would be you have 60 mature cows, 
22 year old heifers, 20 yearling heifers for a total of 100 females, uh, and they are all breeding, and you'll be able to produce your 40,000 pounds um, of calf if you have an 80% winning rate. Now, if you do not breed yearlings, you need, for example, 80 mature cows, 22 year old heifers. You need to have the 20 yearling heifers, which will not be in reproduction. So you have a total of 120 females, but only 100 of those females will be breeding for to produce the same amount of calves. So we have a larger herd here, uh, but the productive herd is uh, same as the previous one. So you need more animals, which is not uh, in the same line that we want to go if you want to decrease methane production uh, if you do not breed your yearling heifers. So the conclusion here is that you may have the same total production for less females if you breed yearlings. And this means less methane, which is, again, is gonna look good for our industry. And perhaps with some calculations, it's gonna be good again for our pockets. So the topics for today, uh, with that as an introduction, and here already your take home messages, if you don't wanna listen anymore to my talk, uh, and uh, are uh, three main topics. I'm gonna speak about reproductive efficiency, and the guiding principle here is that breeding early in the season is critical to maximize lifetime productivity. I'm talking about heifer fertility, and the guiding principle is puberty attainment prior to the breeding is critical to yielding heifer fertility. And throughout the talk, I'll talk about reproductive technologies. And the guiding principle here is that the use of technology will benefit your cow-calf operation. Apply it gradually, don't jump to the most advanced one, and have realistic expectations. Those are the three topics. Uh, I'm gonna be talking about them uh, um, uh, in, a, in a mixed way. It's not gonna be uh, in this order, but you see these are the important topics for today. So here, here are uh, technologies that we can use in reproduction, and, I'm, I'm, and pretty much I'm gonna touch in each one of these during the presentation. You have a ranking of technological level from more simple, from control of the breeding season, all the way to more complex using ovum pickup, when, uh, uh, embryo production in vitro and embryo transfer. And again, we have to see what is uh, more suitable for your production system here in Florida. So talking about, uh, to, to start with the breeding season. So if your cow gets bred, on the very first day of the breeding season of year one and has a gestation between 285 to 295 days, if she is to produce one calf at every year, exactly one having a exactly 12 month calving interval, she only has 70 to 80 days to get pregnant again after that calving. If she is to be bred again on the first day of the subsequent breeding season. Uh, from those 70 to 80 days, 30 days is uterine evolution. So in practicality, she'll have between 40 and 50 days to get pregnant again. If, if you are to keep a one calf a year, one calf every 12 months from every cow. And that's a challenge. And this is, and, and, and we have to get that in mind when we are calculating the dynamics of the breeding season. So let's see that in a multi-year scenario. So these are four years. Uh, we have a calving season and a breeding season for each of years one, two, three, and four. Uh, we have our breeding season from February 1 to April 30th. Uh, it will be representative of, for some of the operations here in Florida. Then you have the calving season between November and February. So let's start with the success scenario. And the success scenario is that the dam and the yearling heifer are pregnant at the beginning of breeding season on year four. So here's, here's our dam. She got spread on the very first day of, of the breeding season. Then uh, next, next year she gives, uh, she calves a heifer. And then she gets pregnant again on year three and again on year four. That heifer that was born on the very first day of the calving season, now she's, uh, she's grown up and she joins the next year uh, breeding season and again gets, and also gets pregnant on the very first day and gestates. So that generates a great scenario in, the, in which by year three, you have both the heifer and the mother again becoming pregnant. And that's the sense of this picture here. 
So that's this heifer here. She was the first one born at the Kevin season uh, that started last year in November. And that's her mom. So that's that scenario uh, um, is possible. And these ladies here, both of them, they are heroes, and they are the ones that we should be uh, uh, trying to uh, 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 obtain in our operations. Those guys that get 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 that are born early in the season, that get early in the season, and she's probably very uh, has has a very great probability of joining the next breeding season and be a successful breeder. Now that's a bad scenario here, in which the cow actually got pregnant on the last day of the breeding season. She almost didn't didn't make the cut. And then, was, and then so her uh, calf was born on the very last day of the calving season. And when she reaches the subsequent breeding season, she'll be too young and she doesn't get pregnant. And her mom next year also doesn't make the cut. So that's a challenging scenario in which the dam and the yearling heifer do not, are not pregnant at the end of the breeding season. And either you're gonna have to make a decision of culling one of them or both of them, or maybe keeping this heifer for another year, uh, just eating uh, without producing any calves. So that's a challenging situation and we, and we must avoid that. So when, we, when we're talking about uh, uh, management of the breeding season, we have to be keeping track of each of our animals uh, the best as possible and trying to make our decisions uh, before the lack of profit shows up. This is how we control it here. It sounds uh, complicated, but I'll, I'll go through with you. Uh, for each of our categories, we have multi-breed cows, multi-breed heifers, Brahma cows, Brahma heifers, in our embryo transfer program, you just lay out along a course of two, three, four years, whatever you want, your calving season, your breeding season, and then your winning. So for example, here on this figure, the black bar represents the winning date, and then this is the uh, the age of each of the calves uh, when they reach 210 days of age. So uh, because the bar is uh, very much to the right of this figure, that means that most of our calves will have 210 days before the winning date. But a few of these calves uh, at winning date, they will be still light. So this bar here is critical. If it is too much here to the left, that means that you're gonna win a lot of uh, very light calves, and that's because they were born very late in the season. So this kind of uh, diagram you might find useful to uh, apply to your operation so you can track how you're doing over time. So as a next uh, possible technology, uh, timed bull breeding. So when I come here to Florida, I make a little survey to, uh, to check out the producers, the use of artificial insemination. And I saw that, I noticed that it was not a lot. Very few producers are using them when they're using artificial inseminations, mostly for heifers, for yearling, for, for, for breeding heifers, which is good, but not the other animal categories. So if it's not the reality, uh, let's go one step before AI, which is time bull breeding. And basically time bull breeding means to use a synchronization protocol prior to, right on the beginning of your breeding season but do not but not inseminating the animals just leaving them to bulls and we did our very first trial here in florida uh, at mr ralph Pelais ranch uh, the san marino ranch uh, and this is what we did we submitted his uh, beautiful brangus heifers to a very simple synchronization protocol consisting consisting of in, in inducing puberty in these heifers by a sitter in an injection of prostaglandin F2 alpha. We checked heat for five days. We waited another 14 days, and then we released them with the bulls in a one to 10 ratio. But then by the end, um, as days were going by, he was removing bulls, and at the end, the bull ratio was one to 25. We checked, we preg check at, at, at different spots during this process. And what we found just using this very simple procedure, is that the, preg the, uh, the pregnancy rate at 60 days of the breeding season was 75, 78.5%. And when we removed the bulls and we checked for the last time, we had a 92% pregnancy rate and Mr. Roth was really happy. And this was very useful to get this uh, heifers um, set up for getting bred. When, it, when we did this again uh, uh, this year, 
uh, we used the very same protocol, except that this time we did not wait the 14 days. Cedar for seven days, prostaglandin injection at, the, at cedar removal. So you catch the animals two times. And right at that time, we released the heifers with the bulls. It had about a 40% uh, uh, pregnancy rate on the very beginning of the breeding season. By 60 days, 89% of his heifers were pregnant. And when we removed the bulls and we did the last preg check, 93% of them were pregnant. So the pregnancy on the very beginning, which is induced by this protocol, is very useful, very simple to do, and we really maximize pregnancy rates at the end of a breeding season. How about cows? So we use a very similar protocol, but here are using some cows right from Ona uh, that was uh, done together with, a, with, a, with the Felipe uh, Moriel. Uh, and then again, we had a control group and a group of cows that we submitted to this protocol. This time we used GnRH in the beginning and the Cedar and PG in a process landing at removal. And then we released with the bulls and preg check throughout the process. So they are multiparous crossbred cows, 120 animals, and I want to, uh, uh, and, and I'd like you to, to, to drive your attention to this line here of the table. Pregnancy at 45 days of the breeding season, that's when we were able to uh, do the preg check, was 29% if the cows he did not receive a cedar, and 42% uh, if the cows received the cedar. So that goes together with our principle of getting cows bred early in the breeding season. So it's a simple protocol. We caught the, 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 the cows two times, and we get a greater proportion of cows getting pregnant at the beginning of the season. And by the end of the season, there's no difference, but it's about between 87 and 92% of the cows were pregnant. So you will get a lot of cows pregnant at the end, there's no doubt about it, but the good thing is to try to get them bred early, and this is what using a protocol with bulls, no AI, will help you to achieve. How about MGA? So lots of people don't want to do the cedar because it is, it is more expensive uh, and you have to catch the cows at least twice to put the cedar and to remove the cedar. I like the cedar. And the reason is because it is very precise. You know exactly what you're putting in and, and uh, when you are inserting the cedar and when you are removing the cedar. So it is technically simple to do. Although I recognize it might be more expensive because you have to bring the cows in twice. The MGA, it is, it is much less expensive, but it's much more technical. You must be sure that your, all of your heifers have, are having access to the, to, to, the, uh, to the prescribed amount of MGA every day throughout the administration day. Then other animals should not be getting it. So uh, if, if it is feeding for 14 days, every day they must be able to consume the amount that is predicted. So it's a little bit more technical, but it's very effective. Look at this. These were Branga's heifers from uh, uh, Mr. Well, uh, Wes Williamson, another collaborator of ours. They were treated with MGA for 14 days. We waited for 19 days. Then I just did something very simple before putting the bulls. We inject them with prostaglandin or not. And the idea here was to concentrate the heats and have a larger amount of them bred uh, right on the beginning, right, right after um uh the, the moment of both end and then we prep check them and this is what we got uh, so on the on the very beginning uh of the breeding of the breeding season on the very first days uh, after we released the bulls we got about uh about 35 percent of them pregnant and there was no effect of prostaglandin so that injection didn't help us at all and the first 60 days he had between 75 and 79 percent we're not be able to do a a final prep check on these animals because of COVID. Uh, so the take home message here is that yes, MGA uh, is, is, is interesting because we could get, we, we, we were able to get a lot of the animals bred uh, right after exposure to the bulls, but the extra injection of prostaglandin did not help us here. And these were again, Brunga's heifers. Uh, uh, as a second study, we had uh, we, we we conducted that at uh, uh, Perry Cattle Company. Those are, these are heifers from the Longino Range. So these are, these here are our collaborators on that study. And these animals had been uh, exposed to MGA for 14 days, 
But then we try to see if addition of a cedar uh, and synchronization of these animals after exposure to MGA would be helpful. These are Brangus heifers. And here's the result. So the animals that received um, uh, a cedar, uh, they were not, they were, so treating with the cedar or not treating with the cedar did not interfere in our pregnancy. It was about 50, let's say 48% on average uh, in, in response to AI. And then at the end of the season, they, they had about 90% pregnant, uh, pregnant animals. So exposure to MGA, positive. A subsequent exposure to the cedar, not necessary. As we increase our technological level, let's go for AI plus bull. And this is what we do here at our operation and in the, in the gains with beef units. Here's the protocol we use. We have been using this for many, many years. It's a select sync protocol, cedar for seven days, generate at cedar insertion and prostaglandin at removal. Then uh, our manager, Danny Driver, he will observe heat two time, two to three times a day, every day for three days. And he will inseminate uh, 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 these animals that show heat, see in the morning, inseminate on the afternoon and vice versa. And then at, at, at the end of 84 hours, the cows that did not show heat, he will time AI together with an injection of GnRH. So it's called the select sink plus sitter. And I want to show you these results because I want I, I think it's important that, that people have benchmarks, that they know the potential of the different uh, technologies. So this is our real data obtained obtain in our herd, which is run as in a in a commercial operation. And it goes by categories, and you're gonna see the category to the, uh, the the pregnancy rates to the AI, and then the cumulative pregnancy rate that we measure at the end of the season by category. So our yearling heifers, 40% of pregnancy to AI, and 80% at the end of the season. Our primi pairs, 43% at AI, and 80% at the end. Our second deeperous, uh, which are the cows that are three year olds, they got pregnant at 34% uh, to AI and 83% at the end. In our multi paris cows, they were pregnant 44% uh, at, the, at the end of AI and 92% at the end of the season. So these are good benchmarks and we will be producing a EDIS publication with this data from now on that will show the data from our unit, from the owner unit and from the Mariana unit. So the producers from Florida can see what we do and what we get and can benchmark with what they're doing at their ranches. This is what Angela and the crew at the uh, North Florida rack are doing over there in Mariana. It's a very similar protocol, but here, instead of, 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 uh, of inseminating at heat throughout four days, what they do is that is they check heat 48 hours after removal of the cedar, and they will inseminate the cows that are in heat next morning and treat the remainder with GnRH, and then also inseminate the, rate of the, the, the rest of them in a time AI uh, protocol system. And then seven days later, they will add the bulls. Here's what they get for the yearlings, primiparis, secondiparis, not a lot, only 11 of them, and multiparis, very comparable to our data, 42, 7, 42 to AI and 76 for our yearlings, 30% uh, and 90% for the primiparis, a little less, 27 and 64 for the few secondary pairs animals, and the multi pairs got 62% to the to the uh, AI and 85% at the end of the season. So again, this will be available for all the community very soon, so people can see how we're doing and how we are doing in comparison. Uh, this is our Brahma herd. So before I was, I was showing our multi breed herd. Uh, this, these are the Brahma animals, and here's what we get. Uh, in terms of pregnancy for AI, just the pregnancy to AI with the, the preg check, the final preg check of the season will be done last year. So I just have the uh, response to AI. So our yearling heifers, yes, we do inseminate our yearling Brahma heifers, 17% of them get pregnant. Our prima pairs, 40%, the secondary pair is 52%, and our multi pair is 43% uh, to a single AI. Those are very good numbers, very realistic numbers. And these are all animals pregnant on the very first day of the breeding season. And they also have another 80 to 90 days to get pregnant if they did not get pregnant here to AI. So we are striving using protocols and inseminating animals 
to do exactly what we are preaching, which is trying to get him pregnant very early in the season. Now, a few questions that producers and uh, accounting agents all, uh, many times have, and also questions that we do ask ourselves. How well do cows that calved early in the calving season do in the subsequent breeding season? So our gospel would be, well, they do better. And here what it is. Um, so, so these are pregnancies to artificial insemination. And at the end of the season, for cows that calved on November, December, January, and a few of them that calved in February in our uh, production system. And what we can see is that uh, pregnancy to AI go from 44% down to 32%, and pregnancy at the end of the season go from 91% to 80 and 73%. So yes, it is true. A cow that calves later in the season, next year, she'll have a harder time to breed and her pregnancy rate will be lower. So again, uh, striving to get them bred early in the season. And here are the numbers. So we don't. So we're not just talking about it. We're seeing the numbers, and we're seeing if it is true or not. A second question that always pops up: How well does a heifer that was bred as a yearling do as a first cat heifer in terms of pregnancy? And here what will be the idea. Well, you know, it's tough to breed them as yearlings because they have a tough time to get pregnant as prima pairs. So here's what we get from our from our multi breed herds. The same animals that that were able that that that, that um, calved as yearlings and how they did as prima pairs and as you can see their production was a little bit less about five uh, percent points less as prima pairs than they did as yearlings but they is is definitely not catastrophic from 45 to 40 the response to AI and from 82 to 77 percent at the at at the end of the season. So it is not catastrophic to breed their yearlings. They will know that they will not do that bad when they are prima pairs animals. And here are the numbers to support that concept. How much better do calves born early in the calving season do in terms of winning weight and fertility when they become a heifer? So here we separate our heifers born in November, December versus the heifers that were born in January and February. And we're glad to say to say that the one that we have a 147 of them, so three quarters of them were born early, and only one quarter of them was born on the second half of the calving season. But uh, although they had they were they were younger and they were lighter in terms of weight body weight, their reproductive performance was not that different. Exactly was the same uh, uh, pregnancy for AI. And a little bit less, but almost the same. I would say that's the same, not significantly different overall reproductive performance at the end of the breeding season. So in this case, we did not see a difference between heifers that, 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 that were born earlier or later in the calving season. So time AI, that's the dream, right? So uh, we don't want to be catching cows many times to, to just inseminate as, at, at asterisk, although that would be the ideal for fertility, we like to, to see a time AI protocol. And uh, I'm, I'm particularly, uh, at this moment, I'm, I'm refraining to push for time AI uh, before I understand more of the system. And here's some data. So first, let's look at this uh, right panel here. So the pregnancy to AI in our hands of the cows that showed asterisk is 62%. While the cows that we did time AI, that means they did not show estrus. So then they all received an injection of generation and were bred, is only 21%. So it is less. And the estrus distribution to our protocol is basically, as you see, both for 2019 and 2020, it is distributed in a 24 hour period between 48 and 72 hours. So it is, it is not a easy to pick a time in which you would be able to get the best uh, fertility if you just inseminate at a single time. So perhaps just like Angela is doing up in Mariana, a split time uh, approach uh, would be uh, the most viable one in which you catch the animals two times. First one is based on heat, and the second one, you're gonna catch all the animals uh, that, that will be in heat on the previous morning, 
uh, and will uh, show heat very close to the time that you're inseminating, but you will induce them to ovulate using a GnRH. So this is the next, in my opinion, uh, step if you want to get closer to less handling and greatest fertility, remembering that you know if if asterisk is involved in the protocol, if they are in asterisk, your fertility is going to be much maximized. So now coming down our our scale here, how about doing time AI and resyncing the animals and doing another artificial insemination? So we did this in a very limited number of animals, 27 of our Brahma cows. So they were subjected to the protocol as we do normally. They were time AI, but then we use a resynchronization strategy. What does that mean? 14 days after AI, without knowing anything about these animals, but just that they were inseminated, we inserted another seeder on these animals and we left that seeder for seven days. Then on day 21, we examined these animals using Doppler ultrasonography, which allows us to detect pregnancy as early as 21 days. How is that done? So basically you make an image of the ovary and of the corpus luteum. If there is very, if it is not vascularized, and you can see that using Doppler ultrasonography by the color Doppler uh, markings, this animal is not pregnant. You inject them with prostaglandin F2 alpha, and two days later, and then you start observing her for heat and inseminate her for a second time. What is our false negative here? Is 0.1%. So one in 1,000 cows, you will be detected as a false negative. That means you told that she was negative, but she was also, but she was actually pregnant. So it's very safe to use if you knew how to use the Doppler and that technology. Uh, how about if she's pregnant? How do you know? Her corpus luteum will be very highly vascularized, and you'll be able to see that in the image, and then. You consider that cow as pregnant, you do nothing, just remove the seeder and let her go and hopefully she'll, she'll carry you on their pregnancy. But here we have a 10% false positive. You will call that animal pregnant, but she just had a vascularized carp luteum, but it was not pregnant. But again, she'll have the remainder of the breeding season to be, uh, to be bred by a bull. So uh, it's very good. And this is the result. We got on those 27 Brahma, this is just a small experiment, we had a 48% uh, pregnancy to the first AI. Then we had a second AI after resynchronization, we got four more of them pregnant. And that got as a cumulative pregnancy rate of 63%. So in 24 days of the breeding season, we have 63% of these animals pregnant. Later, we find out that one of these animals that were that were bred was all was actually a false positive, so that was our seven percent rate positive uh, rate of of false false positive animals. But again, that calculates out to fifty nine percent pregnant animals in the first twenty four days of the breeding season. Very attractive. There is management. You have to catch the animals two more times. But again, what is the price of having two thirds of your animals bred on the first twenty four days of the breeding season? It, we have to calculate, you have to calculate and see if, if it is worthwhile for you. But most importantly, this is done worldwide. We had to show that it can be done in Florida. And here you go, it's shown that it can be done in our Brahma cows. So the very top uh, level of technology is doing ovum pickup, doing IVF and the embryo transfer. That means you will choose your donor animals. You will collect all sites from them. You collect the semen from the best bull and fertilize those old sites in vitro, produce embryos and transfer. And I'm not gonna, uh, for, 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 for time's sake, uh, I'm not gonna tell the results, but we have been doing this. It was supported by the Florida Cattlemen Association. It, that's uh, on the expansion of our Brema herd. And just overall, we selected our donor cows, both by genomic uh, parameters, and by phenotypic parameters, and we were helped by the manager, Danny Driver, Dr. Hansen, Dr. Matisco, and Dr. Trift. And we collected those sites from 13 of our best Brahma cows, produced the embryos, and we have recipients now pregnant 
from these embryos here in Florida. So again, in our herd, the very top in terms of technology, we can do it and we are doing it and we have been successfully on doing it. And uh, if you are interested, let us know, give us a ring and we'll help you out on that. This is a, a important uh, project that has to do with heifers and I have to share with you because it was also uh, sponsored by the Florida Cattlemen Association. Many ranchers were, uh, were, were involved in this project and it has to do with puberty induction as a strategy to increase reproductive performance of Brahma influenced heifers. We thank everybody that's been involved. It's been a, a very good uh, experience. And here, what we do is basically do a pre-breeding heifer evaluation, which is called a reproductive track score. And basically, we use an ultrasound to evaluate the uterus and the ovaries of, of these heifers to check for attainment of puberty. In the ovary, we check for the presence of a follicle in a corpus luteum. And in the uterus, we check for how thick it is, which is a representative of maturity of the reproductive tract and the ability of that heifer to become pregnant. This is Tiago, and he's doing all of this work here, working together uh, with Logan at his, uh, 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 with some of the cows. And we are doing preg check on this case, but this is uh, what we are doing for reproductive tract score as well. So here are the classifications. They go from one to five. The first three reproductive tract scores, uh, they are from, uh, from heifers that, that have not uh, attained puberty. The four and the five, they are either pubertal or they're attaining puberty. And again, it is based on ovarian characteristics and uterine characteristics that we are able to measure and assign a score to these animals. So in our, in our project, uh, our idea was to check the uh, necessity to induce puberty in animals, and we use that, and we and we that we did that by fir first classifying animals as pubertal or prepubertal based on reproductive tract scores that we did too, 10 days apart, and then we split these heifers to either receive a cedar or do not receive a cedar for induction. Now, all of these animals were subsequently exposed to a synchronization protocol, and they were and they were all artificially inseminated based on heat or based on time AI. So first of all, here's the reproductive track scores of animals prior to the beginning of the breeding season and just prior to insemination. So what, so what we see is that we had animals that were already pubertal, they had a, a large reproductive track score, and regardless if these animals received or did not receive a cedar, most of them maintained a high reproductive tract score just prior to insemination. Now, the animals that were prepubertal, so they had a low reproductive tract score on average on the, on, on the beginning of our induction. Uh, despite the fact that they received the cedar or did not receive a cedar for induction, because they all did receive a cedar for synchronization, they all had an increased reproductive tract score just prior to insemination. So we were expecting that cedar would induce uh, a lot more animals to become pubertal, and that was statistically significant, but you can see that overall the trend was to have, it was that the, even the prepubertal animals did increase the reproductive tract score and achieved puberty uh, just based on the cedar from the synchronization protocol. This is a, a different way to look at that information, and that's a little bit complicated, but I'm gonna uh, walk you through this. So this is the reproductive track scores of these animals prior to induction. So this is how we found the animals, and they were classified in, in, in reproductive track scores from one to five. There were less animals with the reproductive scare, uh, scores of one and two, and more three, four, and much more with five. First important information is that we are, at each of these points is a heifer. And we are uh, showing the distribution of this heifer according to the reproductive track score to their body weights. And you can see that from very light body weights to 
very to to, to much heavier uh, body weights. Um, they were distributed in the different categories of reproductive tract score. So it's not that it's not that just oh the heavy heifers had a high reproductive tract score. That's not true. The same happened to lighter heifers. A second important information here is that we marked heifers with a with a with a circle if or just prior to insemination, they had the reproductive tract score less than four. So they were still immature at the time of AI. Or if they mark as a triangle, if they did increase the reproductive tract score and they had four or five reproductive tract score just prior to AI. So what we can see here is that if they had a reproductive tract, a low reproductive tract score, when we started induction, by the time of AI, only 32% of them did increase their reproductive tract score and became mature. And that's gradually increasing up to the point that, of course, if they were already mature prior to induction, a very large proportion of them were still mature at the time of AI. In terms of pregnancy, uh, again, uh, which is similar to what I showed in terms of the reproductive tract scores, what we found was that the prepuberal heifers, despite if they were treated or not treated with the cedar, they got pregnant at about 30% uh, of the cases to AI, while the animals that were puberal, they were pregnant about 46 to 47% of the time. So in our case, we had to reject our hypothesis and pre-exposure to a cedar did not induce animals that were pre-puberal to puberty to uh, become pregnant to a single AI. When we look at the distribution of open and pregnant animals according to the reproductive tract score prior to AI, what we see is very remarkable. So animals that entered uh, prior to entering the breeding season, when they were at the point of induction, 23 days before artificial insemination, if they had a reproductive score of one, only 17% of those animals became pregnant. And that again increased gradually. And if they had attained puberty prior to the beginning of the breeding season, they got pregnancy pregnant at 46% of the cases. So again, evaluating the status of these animals, prior to the beginning of the breeding season, see this one and twos here, you, you will have a very good idea of what your animals are going to do uh, if you inseminate them, if you, if you uh, carry them on through the breeding season. And here's a overall breakdown of the animals. So this is pregnancy to AI and, and cumulative pregnancy to the end of the breeding season of animals that scored, reproductive tract scores one or two, in black versus animals that had a reproductive tract score three and five in gray prior to the beginning of the breeding season. And again, this is what you should expect. If your animals enter the breeding season with their blood tract scores of one and two, this is how much, this is how well they're gonna do. They're gonna get 27% pregnant in the beginning and will you know, finish the breeding season 77%, while the if, if they are mature with their reproductive tract score, of three to five, they will get pregnant in a much higher proportion of the very beginning of the breeding season. And again, that's very important for the reproductive success of the remainder of the reproductive life of that animal. So knowing how she's gonna do in the beginning of the season is very important. With that, I wanna make a little uh, advertisement here for a program that you should stay tuned is gonna come about that's called Who's My Heifer? And there's a program to, that, 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 with, that has the objective to establish a statewide system to generate and analyze report information on the reproductive potential and performance of replacement heifers. In practicality, we'll go to your ranch and we'll do reproductive track scores prior to the breeding season and we'll measure the performance of these heifers by a prac check at the end of the season. And you'll be able to know for your operation, how your heifers are doing, make your strategic decisions, and we'll also integrate a program that's an educational program and an extension program in which we'll gather information for the whole state of Florida and, and help us 
uh, develop further education programs and strategies for the producer. So stay tuned. Uh, that's going to come up hopefully on this breeding season that's just coming around the corner. Uh, finally, before I finish, I just want to use this last two minutes to show the limit of uh, what we are doing now in terms of technicality. And this is another project that we're very fortunate to get sponsored by the Florida Cattlemen Association, which is predicting puberty in Brahma heifers. And the specific objectivity objective of this proposal was to discover non-genomic molecular markers that means from blood samples that could be used to predict early puberty in Brahma heifers. As we know, the Brahma influence uh, has as one of, the, of its characteristics to cause delayed puberty. So can we predict that earlier? This is what, this is the experiment we designed. This is just with Brahma animals from winning and monthly we collected blood samples. And then we examined these animals phenotypically so we knew which ones got pregnant and which ones did not get pregnant. And we know the reproductive track scores of each of these Brahma heifers throughout the breeding season and prior to the breeding season. We have these two blood samples, one that we collected one month prior to the breeding season and one that we collected three months prior to the breeding season. And our idea is, can we analyze the samples, measure the concentration of specific metabolites, and can predict just based on these samples which heifers will become pubertal and the ones that will not become pubertal. And, 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 and to be very specific, we consider that only the pregnant heifers as the one that achieved puberty and the ones that were not pregnant and had a low reproductive tract score during uh, the breeding season as non-pregnant. And these are the results. They're a little complex, but you'll be able to figure it out. Each one of the circles represents a heifer. A green circle represents a, a heifer that reached puberty and did become pregnant at the end of the season. And the red circles represent uh, heifers that remain prepubertal. And these are the results three months prior to the breeding season. And here are the results one month prior to the breeding season. And we can see that specifically here, if you, vary, if you go one month prior to the breeding season, you can pretty much separate, just based on a blood, samples, a blood sample, the heifers that will achieve puberty to the heifers that will not achieve puberty. There's one, two, three heifers that could not be distinguished. They could be in any one of the groups, but all the rest of the, re of the heifers would be very clearly separated. If you want to try to do this earlier, it becomes more tricky. And as you can see, there will be more heifers that could be either pubertal or not pubertal, but some of them already exhibit a pattern of blood metabolites that will uh, help us to predict that they will be the ones that will achieve, achieve uh, uh, puberty and pregnancy. And some of them, there will be uh, late puberty achievers and uh, will, not be, uh, will not produce a calf to that breeding season. So in conclusions, reproductive and nutritional management of heifers and cows should aim to maximize pregnancies early in the breeding season. Exposure to a synchronization protocol followed by natural breeding, RAI, increases pregnancies early in the breeding season. Pre-breeding season evaluation by reproductive track score provides a decision tool for heifer reproductive management. And puberty can be induced by exposure to progesterone or to MGA. And I have to thank all of these people that are involved, both in our program, Felipe, Leo was here, Mariana, uh, Tiago did most of the work that I'm sharing with you today. Uh, Cecilia is a doctoral student, and uh, many people, faculty, many of the ranchers were really thankful. Uh, the Florida Academy Association and Swedish for donating drugs for the success of this program and for all the information I'm sharing with you today. So without any more, I'm sorry, I, I know that I spoke too much, but I had things that I was very excited to share with you today. I'm happy to answer any questions now. Great, thank you, Dr. Benelli. Everyone, if you have a question, please type it in the questions panel for Dr. Benelli. 
And as he mentioned, you can also follow up with him anytime by email or phone. And uh, something else that while we're waiting that I'd like to mention is after this program ends, you will receive a, a quick survey that we would really love to, to hear from you to get your input, um, not only on this program and what you learned, how you enjoyed it, also, uh, very soon, we're going to be setting up our schedule for 2021 ONA Highlights, and we're interested to know um, what topics you might be interested in hearing from our faculty in regard to their disciplinary expertise, as well as uh, if you might know of a guest presenter that we might welcome next year. Uh, as Dr. Benelli, we usually have a few presenters that are guests. Is there anybody in particular that you think that we should invite? That question is also on there. All right, we have a question or a comment. Um, Kurt says, thank you, Dr. Benelli. Excellent presentation and great information for Florida cattle producers. Thank you. That's really appreciated. That's the idea. To uh, see what's uh, available and what's limited here, and try to contribute with uh, with our expertise. We do a boots on the ground approach. We go to a ranch. We help you uh, to try to implement some of these technologies and to understand, hopefully, better what's going on. And if you, and of course, and many times it can be improved. And we are here. For that. Thank you. Okay, we have a question from Joe Bitter. <clears throat> He says, great information or great presentation today. What was the criteria to when the breeding season started in most of your studies? And any info or results for your last heifer induced puberty study using heifer's age as variable instead of the weight like you showed? So um, the criteria to, to, to start the breeding season um it's, it's 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 sometimes set to most of the operations and it's basically a you have to do a calculation uh forward to the time when you plan to have your calves weaned and shipped and that has market considerations that every operation has to do so depending on when you're planning on commercializing your calves you have to uh, go back and uh, figure out where you want to start your breeding season. So in South Florida, uh, I can see from the operations that I've been, people try to get their animals bred by the end of December, most of the time. Here in our operation, we breed them a little bit later uh, in February. In our Brahma herd, we breed them in, in April and May. And the idea is to avoid calves being born in the colder months because we do have some calf mortality associated with cold spells. Uh, specifically to that Brahma herd, it's interesting because very recently we shifted the breeding season a month ahead exactly with the, as a strategy to prevent birth of calves on the colder months. So, you know, it is something that you can manipulate um, and adjust, but basically it should be, should be uh, coherent with the times, with, uh, with the moment that you're thinking about commercializing your calves. In terms of the second question, so in terms of, of, uh, of, uh, of age, uh, there is variability. Age is pretty much associated with, uh, with body weight. Uh, there is a range. There will be heifers that are younger, but they will achieve puberty uh, at a younger age. Uh, but usually, um the attainment of puberty is associated with it, with age so trying to get them induced or trying to get them bred uh when they are very early you're not going to be successful your brick track score is going to be low and will must probably remain low for a long portion of the season and the, and what can happen to you is that maybe she will get she will attain puberty by the end of the season then she'll get bred at the end of the season and she'll be that problematic heifer for you to the end of your life, which is all the time she's going to get bred at the end of the season until she fails a year 
and then uh, you have gonna have to call her. Okay, um, you have one more question from Micah. Yes, is the breeding calendar spreadsheet available? Uh, uh, that's that's um, we can we I can make that available no problem. Uh, that was uh, that was basically something we we uh, we, we made uh, in house for because I think it makes it very easy to uh, to visualize what we are doing. I'm always trying to uh, to benchmark you know to to show exactly what we are doing so that you know so so it goes beyond just talking about it. You actually you can actually see it. But uh, I can I can send you what I uh, uh, what I got. It's not a, a a a model for you to fill in your data, but you you're just giving me an idea. Maybe I'll do that. Maybe I'll try to produce something that you can uh, yourself enter your own information there. It's very useful for me. I'm a visual person, and when I see it, you know, I can much easier talk about it. So yes, we can we can do it. If you shoot me an email, uh, I can try to uh, talk to you and arrange something specifically for you. Dr. Bitter says, and about the ciders used in your studies, were all brand new ones or were some second or third time use? So it, it, it was highly dependent on, on which study, but we did use all kinds of ciders, not just uh, not just new ones. We used used ciders also that we uh, sanitized and uh, reutilized them. And the idea there is to have a less concentration of progesterone in this uh, cedar implants which are usually favorable for brahma cows and for brahma influenced cows that do not do very well with used cedars sometimes with that with new cedars sometimes so we used we used previously used cedars yes 